Amen. Good morning. How are we this morning? Are we awake? Kind of, a little bit? Getting there? Uh, my name is Brandon. If I haven't met you yet, one of the pastors here, we're super glad to have you with us today. Um, last week, we uh, talked about what I said was a potentially undiagnosed problem in your marriage. And that was a fun one, wasn't it? Yeah, last week was, uh, was something. It was, it was fun. Uh, today, I want to talk about uh, a similar thing that is a potentially undiagnosed problem in all of your relationships. Uh, I don't want to use the same passage we started in last week. Uh, so I'm going to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. And we'll start there. Um, while you're opening, I'd love to just pray for our time this morning. Father, I pray that you would uh, give us supernatural grace this morning uh, to hear from your word. Um, pray that you give us humility and wisdom and insight. Pray that you would speak through your word in all the ways that you can. And uh, get me out of the way. I know how I have nothing to sustain the souls of those gathered here. So I pray that you would speak through your spirit, through your word, and help us in all the ways that we need it, because they are many. We love you. Amen. All right, starting in Genesis 3, uh, chapter uh, 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. So just to set the scene, the Garden of Eden was a paradise. There was no sin present, no brokenness, no pain, perfect communion with God every day, all day. That means there was no deceit there. There was just truth, just reality. So up until this point, when God said something, they believed him. When they said something to each other, they believed each other. There was no complexity, no ulterior motives, no confusion, no insecurity or second guessing. No, what do you think he meant when he said that? None of that. Doesn't that sound pretty delightful? But here we're introduced to a character who is crafty or deceitful. Let's pick back up in the story. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So notice it starts with a question intended to produce doubt. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? If you know the story, God did not say that. But the question is meant to project that falsehood onto his character. He goes on in verse 4 to expand from confusion and distrust to flat out lies. You will not certainly die, he says. God lied to you. He told you that because he doesn't want you to eat from the tree and have the same power he does. He's trying to keep you down. He must not want you to be satisfied. He must not be as good as you previously believed. He's withholding from you because he is selfish and he's jealous and he doesn't want you to be like him. So think about it this way. The, one of the things that happened with the fall and Adam and Eve was the introduction of the category of false or untrue perception. When I say perception, I simply mean how things seem to you. So up until this point, Adam and Eve's perception of God and, uh, and one another was 100% in line with truth, with reality. But at the moment this talking snake spreads his deceit, their perception has now become an alternate reality in their minds. Their minds now held what they used to believe about God, that he was loving and benevolent, and now also an alternate reality of a nefarious, repressive God, one who should be rebelled against. So the reality of God was traded for, yeah, but what do you think about God? How do you feel about him? What do you think his motives are? Their perception of God began to matter more than the reality of God. The truth about God, what his motives actually are, what his thoughts actually are, becomes less weighty, less powerful, less persuasive to Adam and Eve than their perception of God. So objective truth disintegrates, and now what they have 
is just how it seems to them, their perception. So take me for an example. On one hand, there is the reality of me, who I am in front of God who sees all. And then there's Chris's perception of me. There's Tiffany's perception of me. There's my wife's perception of me. There's my non-Christian neighbor's perception of me. There's the driver I accidentally cut off yesterday's perception of me. Some of these are more positive than others. Some of these are more accurate than others. But if I preach to 200 different people, there will be 200 different perceptions of me. And I'd just like to stop and say for a moment, for those of you who have more positive perceptions, thank you. Thank you so much. This is one of the things that happened when sin entered. A shadow world was created where we deal not exclusively in truth or reality, but in innumerable perceptions, where what we think and feel about God can end up mattering more than the reality of God, where what we think and feel about others can end up mattering more than the reality of them. So let me continue to clarify what I mean by perception and why it plays such a big role in your life and why you may not always realize it. So I'll just paint a picture for you. Picture my family at the zoo. I have four kids, six and under. Uh, Our zoo is wonderful. If you didn't know that, our zoo is like regionally known. It's fantastic. It's amazing. It's a, a, a wonderful thing about Columbia. So picture my family walking around the zoo and one of our kids says, I feel like we should get an ice cream. Now, it's hot. I happen to love ice cream. So I say, sure, let's all get an ice cream. A little later, another kid who has already been in the hot water says, I feel so angry. Amen. I feel so angry. Now, I've already gotten onto this particular child about their behavior and that, their attitude that day. So I say to them, I feel like you are not listening to me. Just within a few minutes, we have three statements, all that start with, I feel. I feel like we should get an ice cream. I feel so angry. I feel like you're not listening to me. Those statements sound very similar, but in reality, they are categorically different. I feel like we should get ice cream as a statement about desire. I feel so angry is about emotion, and I feel like you aren't listening to me is about perception. So in reality, we have three different categories, desire, emotion, and perception. Desire, biblically speaking, is about good and evil. We have good desires that should be cultivated, and we have evil desires that should be put to death and starved. And of course, we can have neutral desires and inordinate desires and so forth, but the category we're dealing with is good and evil. This is how Colossians 3 says it. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So good desires we cultivate and inflame and help grow, evil desires we put to death. Part of growth in Christ is learning to want the right things in increasing measure and wanting the wrong things in decreasing measure. Emotion is about being human and being made in God's image. So God has emotions. Emotions are not good and evil. They aren't true or false. They are simply present. And they should be honestly processed before God. The Psalms are a great resource for this. Some Psalms are uncomfortably honest as David and others process their emotions with God. And lastly, you have perception. Perceptions can be true or false. They can be right or wrong or a mixture of the two. They should be humbly held up for reconsideration. So again, three very different categories undergird Some of the same language we use like, I feel. You can think about Adam and Eve's experience in the garden through the same ones as well. Desire is, I feel like I should, I want that forbidden fruit. That desire happens to be evil and it should have been killed instead of fed. Emotion is, I feel betrayed or hurt. We don't know exactly how they felt, but we do see their actions as a result. Whatever emotions they had were the result of having a deceiver say untrue things about God. And that should have been processed with and before God, not given into. It turns out you can actually feel betrayed by an alternate reality in your mind that isn't even true. 
And lastly, perception. I feel like God is trying to hold me down. That was categorically false. An entirely untrue, damaging perception that should have been reevaluated, but instead was acted upon and accepted. So if you mess these categories up, you're going to run into very big problems in your life and in your relationships. If you lose the essential clarity and nuance between them, you are set up from, for failure from the very beginning. Because indulging a sinful desire leads to death. As Christians, we're called to kill those desires before they kill us. If you tell someone an emotion is wrong, well, that's just unhelpful at best. Stop being angry has nearly never helped anyone. But we are called to process our emotions with and before God, to lay them at his feet to sift through. And the category of perception is where it gets the most tricky because in this framework, failing to challenge someone with an incorrect perception is actually a failure to love them. It's allowing them to live in an alternate reality. So tell me if any of you guys have ever seen this play out in a relationship. So person one says to person two, I feel like you are not hearing me. Person two says, no, I, I am hearing you. Let me recount what you've already said just to make sure that I've heard you. Person one in turn responds, now I feel like you're invalidating my feelings. Person two says, no, I'm not. I'm challenging your perception of what happened. Has anyone ever had that happen to you? Is it just me? A few of you? That's just one example of the absolute chaos misunderstanding these categories has on our relationships. It's absolutely destructive. These categories are different, but they can be connected too. So for example, if you perceive that someone is out to get you, it will affect your emotions. You'll feel fear, maybe anger. If you perceive something to be satisfying, you'll desire it. And oftentimes desire and emotion are downstream from perception. And the problem, as we see in Genesis 3, is that we are susceptible to our perceptions being wildly wrong. And if you cannot have your perception not just challenged, but changed as a result, you will increasingly live in an alternate reality. In Genesis 3, what is God actually doing for them? He's protecting them and us from everything bad that's ever happened, ever. That seems like a pretty decent motive to me, right? Like to protect us all from all of the sin and pain and heartache and suffering that's ever happened in human history. It's a pretty wonderful motive. Yet somehow they are able to come to believe his motive is to deprive them. They conclude that God is the bad guy. That's how badly we can misperceive. And it should be a wake-up call for all of us. Someone who deeply wants good for you, you can become convinced that they want bad for you. To use a modern term, it's a conspiracy theory with absolutely no evidence to back it up. But once they had assigned a negative motive, their perception of God changed. And suddenly his gracious, kind command became the evidence they needed to prove their perception true. And every time we think, God doesn't really love me, God doesn't really want anything to do with me, God doesn't want good for me, God doesn't really care about me, we prove that Genesis isn't just what happened, it's what happens to all of us. We may not live in the Garden of Eden anymore, but I would argue that our lives are marked by this exact same pattern. We question the motive, then we assign a negative motive to God or another person. Then our perception of God or that other person changes. We create an alternate reality in our minds. And then we seek out evidence to prove the negative motive. So have you ever had a friend or a spouse or a family member or coworker tell you that they know what you actually think? Or they know what you actually want in a situation? 
Well, sure, you said that, but I know what you were really thinking. I know what you really want. All you care about is blank. It's a fascinating experience when that happens to you. It's like, you're telling me what I want? You're telling me what I think? Suddenly you're the expert on what happens in my mind, not me? It's a fascinating experience. It certainly happened to me where someone will say to me, blank is all you really care about. And the truth is, I don't really care about blank at all. At all. I never even think about it, but they are completely sure that they are right. And it's not even that I'm trying to defend myself because honestly, I'm not that great. And sometimes I think bad things. I just so happen to not think what you so confidently believe I do. And it's not because I'm righteous, it's just because your perception is wrong. So I say, no, that's actually not what I was thinking. And they come back to me and say, yes, it was. Yes, it was. So now the expert on what I think or feel or care about isn't me, it's you. Perception has overwhelmed reality. The fact that I wasn't thinking that thing doesn't matter because you perceive that I was. And now you're hurt and angry because of it. So God wasn't Adam and Eve's enemy, but they perceived him as such. And we do this with God and with others when we allow our perception of them, however we came to it, to matter more to us than the truth about them. So the end result is relationships that have a lack of truth and grace. Now, this is why this is such a deep concern for me, for our people here in this context. I want you to imagine a scenario with me that you live in a country, purely hypothetical, of course, in which there are deep divisions. Political, economic, religious, class, race, you name it. Each individual with their own unique history, family background, makeup of data points, leading to drastically different viewpoints on a wide range of issues. In this hypothetical country, there's no longer such a thing as news. It's been replaced, at least for the most part, by financially motivated infotainment companies. Infotainment companies. These companies receive revenue not when they present the most accurate version of the facts, but instead based on numbers of viewers or readers. Extreme views receive more clicks and views, which therefore receives more advertising revenue. So anger and fear have been monetized because when you're angry or afraid, you're more likely to click and view. So their business model relies on you becoming outraged or fearful. They've also discovered that correcting people with carefully nuanced information is not good for business. So instead, each organization plays to target audiences' prior beliefs and values. So different people end up having radically different ideas about events, on how serious certain things are, on whether something should be celebrated or bemoaned. And occasionally the news can even differ widely on whether a certain very important thing happened or absolutely did not happen, and what is fake or what is real. I also forgot to mention that people in this hypothetical country have their brains plugged into this magical cloud for a few hours each day. This cloud has powerful, money-hungry algorithms that are trained to be addictive and do nothing but feed each target, I mean person, more of what he or she has already shown likely to click on or watch. So powerful machines beyond our wildest comprehension in this make-believe society turn humans into literal clickbait. You guys ever seen the movie The Truman Show? Anyone remember that movie? Truman Show? It's this guy who goes through his life and all of a sudden he realizes that he's in living a TV show and that he lives in a bubble and everything is revolving around him. And he lives in a reality that's completely unique to him. And he's the only one that knows it, that doesn't know it. So in this hypothetical society, each human ends up actually living and their own personalized Truman Show bubble, where deeply held thoughts and beliefs are formulated based on 
highly individualized experiences and media and social media that actually give you more of what you want, not what is necessarily accurate. Because of this, people gradually become so convinced of their perceptions that they conclude that only a crazy person would disagree with them. Only an outright lunatic would not see the things, th see things the way they see them. They think surely everyone is outraged by the things I am outraged by, only to find that many times they aren't at all. It can be as if the person across the office from you inhabits a different universe than you do. And they might think you are the clueless one. While these hypothetical people are being fed more and more of what they already believe and want to hear, they are also watching as many documentaries and shows as possible that showcase the fact that sometimes conspiracies are true. So uh, stories that are like, see this picturesque American family over here? Guess what? The dad is a murderer. Dun, dun, dun. They highlight and accentuate any time the friend does turn out to be a backstabber. And sometimes the pastor does turn out to be a total creep. Sometimes the government official is actually corrupt. So in this imaginary land, these people become washed over with distrust with any person, any authority, any organization, any group. Suspicion and distrust is our, I mean, their predisposition. And in this hypothetical place, people become susceptible to false information or unproven claims, especially when it fits their preconceived perceptions. So some people become confident that there is a secret global pedophile ring and high places because of online message boards, of all things. Others get to a place where they not just suspect, not just believe it could have happened. That would be one thing. But confidently assert to anyone who will listen that an election was stolen without having the needed concrete proof to back up such an important claim. Others get to a place where they will say gender is a made-up construct. And if we can just get enough people to say the same thing, then it'll be true somehow, magically. Others believe that aliens are hidden all over the planet. And they virtually all believe that anyone in power is evil and abusive and always and only covering their tracks and looking out for themselves. Obviously, this is not hypothetical, as you may have guessed. Talking about you and me and the not-so-United States of America. And what has happened is we've become people so filled to the brim with scandal and cynicism and distrust and anger and fear that by the time we walk into these doors here, that fuse is just already lit. The lens is already locked into place. We've been so primed that when we come together to be the church, we don't even realize how much we are already doing this to one another. We've already been discipled to operate just like the pattern from the Garden of Eden. We question other people's motives. We assign a negative motive. We, our perception of them changes, and we seek out evidence to prove that negative motive. So the plans for Life Group this week don't fully accommodate my preferences these people only care about themselves. They only care about themselves. Is there maybe another potential reason for why the plans ended up the way that they did? Or does that matter? Or can you only see your perception? Did you see that thing she posted on social media? She's one of those people. Maybe, or potentially, is there a perspective she has that if you talked to her and listened, you might not agree, but you'd understand a bit more, at least. He said this to me, and I was hurt by it. He is a monster. What if he's just a sinner who maybe doesn't even know that what he said hurt you? What if it was just a misunderstanding, potentially? And with all this, the doubts just swirl in our minds. Like, do you think this person actually cares about you? They're just being nice. They're just using you for something you don't know about yet. Do you think you can really trust them? Don't you think you're better than these people? 
Don't you think they think they're better than you? Let me share a recently challenging verse for me. Job 36, 13. It says, The godless in heart cherish anger. Any of you guys ever cherished anger in your heart? And I, I think it's such a helpful picture. I, I'd never noticed that verse before. And upon hearing it, I knew exactly what it means. Because I do it sometimes. Or someone has hurt me and I'm angry because of how wrong it was, which can be okay. It, it's okay to be angry when God's will is violated. But I'll nurse that grudge. I'll have anger fantasies in my mind where I tell that person exactly what I think they need to be told, to be put in their place. I'll get a sense of superiority and energy from my anger. I'll cherish it. And the second thing I thought was, man, how many people that I know that have just been torn apart by this? Or their anger seemed to become a driving force in their lives. And they just sought out more opportunities to be offended and outraged and angry. They nursed their anger and cultivated it. They cherished it. And because anger has been monetized in our culture, we have this entire system built and designed to get us to cherish our anger. Where we become addicted to offense taking while our culture just eggs us on. We're on edge. We're suspicious of everyone, just waiting on other people to prove that they are the monsters we quietly assume they probably are. So we try to come together, but we're already so tightly wound that we're just waiting on something to set us off. Like, ooh, let somebody forget about my birthday. You just let them. Let someone say it's something insensitive to me. I will give them what they have coming. My wife, Christy, uh, when she was little, she had these infamous imaginary friends. Their names were Permit, spelled like Permit, and Dexter Hymet. I don't know where she came up with those names, but she did. She would talk to them. She would get mad at people for sitting on them when they chose a chair. They were known at times to ride on ceiling fans around her house. Of course, she didn't tell me any of this until after we were married. But here's what I want you to know. The way some children have imaginary friends, some of you have imaginary enemies. You think your mother-in-law is out to get you the reality is she loves you and just have flaws that particularly bother you. You think your boss has nefarious motives and is set against you. The reality may be that your boss doesn't think about you very much at all. She might prefer that you succeed actually, but have reasonable critique of your work performance. You think that particular life group member is purposefully excluding you but maybe they have no idea you feel that way and they'd be horrified if you found out. They just have different expectations than you do and the friction is entirely unnecessary and damaging. So often the negative and sometimes monster-like qualities of people and our minds are literally figments of our imagination. A story we've weaved based on the few data points we have available to us and those people actually aren't out to get you and have no ill will towards you. And you continuing to believe that they do without honestly reconciling your perceptions, only helps build the shadow world of darkness. The problem is our relationships lack grace and truth. We trust our perceptions way too much. And there's no space for others to be regular old sinners who sometimes hurt us. In stories scriptures tells, we find wonderful news that Jesus came to reverse all of this. So, uh, read with me from John chapter 1, if you have your Bibles open. John chapter 1. Starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is not just some artistic metaphor, but a theological statement. In the beginning was the Word, the voice of ultimate reality who spoke everything that is real into being. He's the radiance of truth in and of himself. Verse two, he was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. 
In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So in other words, Jesus came to turn the floodlights on in the shadow world, to dispel the rumors, the false perceptions, the unrealities in a million different minds. And his radiance is so bright, his truth so weighty, that the lies of darkness will scatter like the cockroaches that they are. Verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So notice the dichotomy here. The father of lies came to the garden, and he created a false reality with his words. The effects of his deceptive words caused humanity to leave the mountain paradise and have to come make their dwelling with him and the land of darkness, the shadow world. Until the word left heaven and became flesh, until he made his dwelling here among us in the shadow world, with the liars, the confused, the distrusting, the cynical. But he was not about to just sit in our misery and chaos with us. No, this was a rescue mission. He came to reinstate reality I love the end of this passage where Jesus, it says Jesus was full of grace and truth, filled to the brim with both. Not even a mixture of falsehood in him. His face gracious and warm as the sun, calling us back to what we lost. So that our relationship with God could be filled with grace and truth. So we can have forgiveness for our sins and truth about who God actually is in the face of all of our false perceptions and truth and grace for our relationships with each other as well, with space for weakness and sin in our midst, and relentlessly pursuing truth in our perceptions of one another. That's the big idea for this week and next. In Christ, we are to leave the world of shadows and perceptions and unreality and follow Jesus, becoming people of grace and truth in a world where neither abound. But the starting place is simply realizing that, that your perceptions are just perceptions. They can be true. They can be half true. They can be false. That little bit of difference is actually a mile because it allows you, instead of coming into a situation with guns blazing, to say, hey, my perception of this event was blank. Can you help clarify this for me? That is a huge Huge difference. It sounds simple, but it's not at all simple to realize for yourself. The truth is we all have a set of alternate realities in our minds that are wreaking havoc on your life, your joy, your spiritual health. And collectively, those alternate realities damage your marriage, your family, your life group, and our church. Jesus brings grace and truth. Truth, not perception, and grace, not judgment. So just imagine if all of your relationships, no one ever falsely assumed the worst of your motives or intentions, or assumed that you were belittling them or intentionally harming them if you weren't. This is the type of humanity that Jesus displayed in his life and came to offer us a community of grace and truth, where we become peacemakers and a culture of war wagers where we become uncommonly hard to offend. We should be the hardest people in the world to offend because we are full of his grace and because we don't take ourselves too seriously. Where we can remain in relationship if someone says something insensitive. Uh, Do we know that that's an option in our country? We can do that. Not because it's okay, it's not okay, but because you can be a sinner here and we won't pounce all over you. Now we will gently correct and if you defiantly continue, that's a different story, but you were allowed to be a sinner here. Grace and truth. I don't assume I know your thoughts and motives and there's grace for your failures. We'll talk more in detail about this next week, but 
If you will simply just open this category in your mind, it could change so much. So much. If we can get a firm grasp that perception is not reality, you'll often find that people are not sudden enemies, but image bearers of the Most High God with mixtures of sin. They are ultimately exactly what you are. A broken, cynical, lie-believing, unreality-spreading sinner. And aren't you glad that Jesus died for just such as these? For you and I both. Let's pray.